Today, we're going to talk about gas mixtures, and a relationship that applies to all mixtures of gases is something called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. It states that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the pressures exerted by each gas. Air would be an example of a gas mixture. Air is composed of mostly nitrogen, but it has a significant amount of oxygen and some argon in it as well. Typically, atmospheric pressure has a uh, pressure at sea level on Earth on a nice spring day of about 760 torr. But because it's made up of three different gases, if we were to actually remove the oxygen and argon from the container that, and therefore leave only the nitrogen gas inside this shown container here, we would be measuring the pressure of the nitrogen gas in the mixture known as air. That pressure would turn out to be 591 torr. But if we remove the nitrogen and argon instead, leaving the oxygen only in the container and measure the pressure of just the oxygen in the mixture, that pressure would come out to be 161 torr. Finally, if I was able to remove the nitrogen and oxygen out of air, leaving only the argon atoms in there and measure the pressure exerted by the argon atoms, that pressure would be 8 torr. So what Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures states is that if you know what the pressures are of each individual gas in a mixture, their pressures will add up to make the total pressure of the gas mixture. And the pressure exerted by one individual gas in a gas mixture has a unique name. It's called a partial pressure. And it is the pressure the gas would exert if it were alone in a container. Partial pressures are not measurable values we can stick a pressure gauge on any gas container and measure the total pressure of a gas mixture. But we can't tell a pressure gauge to only count when the nitrogen molecules are banging against you and don't count when the oxygens and argons are, aren't. So we can't measure a partial pressure. Those have to be calculated. But they can be calculated from the total pressure of the gas mixture and knowing something else about the mixture itself. If we look at this example, the partial pressure of the nitrogen is way higher than the oxygen and argon, and that's because air is made up of mostly nitrogen. So it turns out that the pressure of a gas is actually related to how many molecules there are of that particular gas in the mixture. So partial pressures are proportional to the quantity of gas in a mixture, and when I use the term quantity, I mean measured in either moles or molecules. So if we're going to actually determine the quantity of each individual gas in a mixture and compare them, we're going to calculate what's called the mole fraction, abbreviated by the Greek letter chi. And it's just the ratio, the moles of one gas in a mixture divided by the total moles of gas in that mixture. And it turns out that the partial pressure of a particular gas in a mixture, which we're going to label as lowercase p sub j, so this would be the partial pressure of gas j, will be equal to its mole fraction, and so its mole fraction will be labeled chi, subscript j, multiplied by the total pressure of the mixture of the gases itself. And whenever we have a total pressure, we usually abbreviate that by a capital P. So writing this algebraically, the partial pressure of one gas in a mixture will equal the mole fraction of that gas multiplied by whatever the total pressure is in the mixture. Let's look at a couple of examples. Let's say a gas mixture has two moles of O2, three moles of N2, and a total pressure of 15 atmospheres. Let's calculate the mole fractions and then the partial pressures of each gas. So to calculate a mole fraction, let's say for oxygen, we're going to need to know how many moles of oxygen are in the container and then divide it by the total moles of gas in that container, when, which in this case is 2 plus 3 or 5. So 2 divided by 5 gives us a one significant figure mole fraction of 0.4. This actually means that on a mole basis, the gas mixture is 40% oxygen. For the nitrogen, we can do the same thing. We can take three moles of nitrogen and divide it by the total moles of the gas mixture. We divide this, we get a one significant figure number, and that 0.6 as a mole fraction means that 60% of the moles in the container are nitrogen. If you notice that percents, 40 and 60 add up to 100, well, mole fractions would therefore add up to one. So actually, when, as soon as I had calculated the mole fraction of oxygen as 0.4, I didn't need to do the second calculation. I knew the nitrogen would have to be 1 minus 0.6 if you want to save yourself a little bit of work. So once you know the mole fractions, here's how we calculate the partial pressures. 
If the oxygen is making up 40% of the molecules in the container, then it only makes sense that 40% of the pressure will be due to the oxygens themselves. So we multiply the pressure of the mixture, which is 15 atmospheres, by essentially 40%, which is 0.4, and that's what we're doing. So 0.4 times 15 atmospheres gives you a pressure for the oxygen or a partial pressure of the oxygen of six atmospheres. The nitrogen's partial pressure will be its mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure, and that comes out to be nine. Notice these add up to 15, partial pressures always add up to make the total pressure in the mixture. And once again here, because there's only two gases in the mixture, once I had calculated the oxygen's partial pressure was six, I could have skipped the second calculation and realized the nitrogen's partial pressure would have to be 15 minus six, and I would get the same answer as well. Let's look at another example. We have a gas mixture that's 70% neon and 30% helium by mass and has a pressure of 5.0 atmospheres. Let's calculate the partial pressures of each gas here. Here the percentages are by mass, so they're not by quantity. So if we have 70% neon and 30% helium by mass, the mole fractions are not 0.7 and 0.3. These are mass data that are given to us. And so what we would need to do, because percentages are given, is we're going to have to make up a fictitious amount of mass for this particular gas mixture. And the easiest thing to do is to assume you have 100 grams of the gas mixture, because if you do, you will therefore have 70 grams of neon and 30 grams of helium. If you know the masses of the gas that make up a mixture, you have to convert those into moles first before you can get the mole fractions and then calculate the partial pressures. So the 70 grams of neon will be converted into moles with its molar mass. And so this fictitious 100 gram sample of this mixture contains 3.47 moles of neon. If I take the 30 grams of helium and use its molar mass to convert the grams into moles, then this fictitious 100 gram sample of this gas mixture contains 7.50 moles of helium. So to calculate our partial pressures, first for the neon, we'll do the mole fraction of neon, which is 3.47 moles divided by the total, and then multiply by the total pressure of the gas mixture, which is 5.0 atmospheres. So I won't specifically calculate the mole fractions, but just show how they're done. It's 3.47 divided by the total, which is 10.97. Multiply that by 5.0 atmospheres, and we'll get a two significant figure answer, 1.6 atmospheres of neon. The partial pressure of the helium has to be 3.4 because you would just go 5 minus 1.6 to get the other gases partial pressure if there's only two in the mixture. But if we want to calculate it out, we'll do the mole fraction of the helium, which is 7.50 moles divided by 10.97 moles, multiply by the total pressure of five atmospheres, and that comes out 3.4 atmospheres of helium. This will be relevant when we're going to later be experimentally collecting gases in lab, and I want to talk about that topic for a few minutes here. If we collect a gas during an experiment, quite often the main purpose for that is to actually calculate the quantity of gas in that container, how many moles are in there. And if you want to determine the quantity of a gas collected in the lab, you actually have to make three measurements about that gas. You have to measure its volume, you have to measure its temperature, and you have to measure its pressure. If you measure these three quantities, which can all be done in lab, we'll talk about those today, then with the ideal gas law equation, PV equals nRT, we can solve for the quantity of gas by just going PV over RT. The way we usually collect gases in lab is in a long glass tube that looks like a really, really long test tube that's called a udiometer, just a fancy gas collecting tube. And we usually completely fill it with a liquid, quite often water, then we turn it upside down and insert it, insert it into a beaker of water, and then we usually clamp it to a ring stand. So in this picture here, I've got an inverted udiometer that's completely filled with water. So what we do is we actually put a hose or some source of gas underneath the bottom of the udiometer, and we let the gas be evolved into the udiometer. It forces the water out, and the gas, because it's less dense than water, rises to the top, and we have the gas trapped in the udiometer. And so after some chemical reaction, you'll have a udiometer that has a significant amount of gas in it. Here's this clear region of the udiometer that's gas. And then right here is where the water level is. So a udiometer, like a graduated cylinder, is 
calibrated here. So we can just read the graduations and we can actually get the volume of gas that's trapped in the udiometer. To get the temperature of the gas, we would have to use a device called a thermometer, but it's hard to get a thermometer up into that udiometer. So usually what we do is we just stick the thermometer into the water. And because the water is touching the gas, we'll assume they're in thermal equilibrium. And that's a fancy way of saying the same temperature. And so we'll have the temperature of the gas. The one tricky thing to calculate is the pressure. And so I wanna do a couple of examples and show you how you determine the pressure of a gas when it's collected in the udiometer, much like in this picture here. I'm gonna start by assuming we're collecting gases by displacement of mercury instead of water. So I have three different udiometers here. They were originally filled with mercury, but a gas has been collected. The gas has forced the mercury out of the udiometer. And we have these three different situations where we could see the volume by reading the graduations. We can measure the temperature by sticking a thermometer into the mercury. And now we wanna be able to measure the pressure of each of these gases. So let's say in each of these, we're collecting hydrogen gas. And on this particular day, the barometer in the room has shown that atmospheric pressure is 765 millimeters of mercury. Here's how we get the pressures of the gas in each of the udiometers. Let's start with udiometer number one. The most important thing is recognizing where the level of mercury is inside the udiometer. And in number one, the level of mercury is the same on the inside of the udiometer as it is on the outside. Why is that significant? The atmospheric molecules are banging down on the surface of mercury in the open beaker. The hydrogen molecules are banging down on the surface of mercury inside the udiometer. And if they both are causing levels of mercury to be the same, that means they're hitting with the same force. Their pressures are equal. So this means the pressure inside the udiometer exactly equals the pressure outside. So if you've read the barometer and the barometer says today's atmospheric pressure is 765 millimeters of mercury, then that means the pressure of the hydrogen gas has to be 765 millimeters of mercury also. That's the easiest situation. Let's go to udiometer number two. In this one, the level of mercury is 13 millimeters higher inside the udiometer than it is on the outside. What does that mean? The atmospheric molecules are banging down on the mercury in the open beaker and pushing the mercury all the way down to here. But the hydrogen molecules, when they're banging on the mercury, are only pushing the mercury down to here. Who's pushing down harder? The atmosphere is pushing down on its mercury harder than the hydrogen gas is. So that means that the pressure inside the udiometer has to be less than atmospheric pressure. How much less? Well, it's the difference in levels less because atmospheric pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. The difference in levels is 13 millimeters of mercury. It's just like a manometer we had learned to read earlier. So this means the pressure inside the udiometer must equal the pressure outside of the udiometer minus the difference in levels. And so therefore the pressure of the hydrogen gas would be 765 millimeters of mercury minus 13 millimeters of mercury. That would come out 752 millimeters of mercury. If that was understandable, if we go to udiometer number three, you can see the level of mercury inside the udiometer is lower than the level of mercury inside the open beaker. Why is that significant? Because that means the hydrogen molecules in the udiometer are banging against their mercury much more strongly than the atmospheric molecules are. So the pressure of the hydrogen gas has to be greater than the pressure of the atmosphere. How much greater? Well, you just have to calculate the difference in levels. We would never in lab do a situation like this because you actually can't see where the level is in the udiometer if it's below the surface of the liquid in the open beaker, but let's say we can tell it's six millimeters lower. So the pressure inside the udiometer would have to be the pressure outside plus the difference in levels. So it would be the atmospheric pressure, 765 millimeters plus six millimeters of mercury difference. And so the pressure of the gas in this particular udiometer would have to be 771. So these calculations actually aren't very difficult but we're never gonna actually be collecting gases in lab by mercury displacement because that's a whole lot of mercury for 28 people to be using in a lab room at one time. And believe it or not, every once in a while, a student will knock something over or break something. And if this beaker tips over and this mercury goes on the floor, then that means somebody has to get out the mercury vacuum and get on their hands and knees 
and try to vacuum up all that mercury. And that person is me. And that mercury rolls around little balls and goes into cracks in the floor. And I'm hunting around for 20, 30 minutes trying to get it all up because mercury is something that's to toxic. And that's not going to matter to you much. You're only in the room for a few hours, for a few days in your life, and then you're going to transfer off and get a degree at a university and then go off and have a job and a family. But I'm going to still be here for 20 more years. And if that mercury is sitting on that floor and it's constantly vaporizing over the next 20 years, and I'm going to get cancer and die. So I don't want to get cancer and die. So I'm not going to let you use giant vats of mercury to collect gases by uh, mercury displacement. So it's much safer for me if you collect gas by water displacement. It turns out to make the calculations a little bit more difficult, but it's better for you to do difficult calculations than for me to get cancer. So we've actually done this once already. We had an experiment where we had an inverted uh, Erlenmeyer flask filled with water and we caused a chemical reaction to occur and we had a little delivery tube underneath that and we trapped the gas by water displacement. That's exactly what we're gonna wind up doing this unit in lab as well. So let's say we we're doing an experiment, we're producing oxygen gas, and we're collecting the oxygen gas, which you can see are the little diatomic red molecules inside the container by water displacement. Well, here's why the calculation is a little bit more challenging. Water is a substance that's fairly volatile. So water evaporates. And there's no reason why the water wouldn't evaporate into that little inverted graduated cylinder, and it's actually going to do that. So whenever a gas is collected by water displacement, some of the liquid water will evaporate into the udiometer, bing, and that udiometer will now contain two different gases, in this case, oxygen and water vapor. So why is that significant? If we calculate the volume of the gas by just reading the graduated cylinder. If we take the temperature of the water and we get the temperature of the gas from that, if we determine the pressure of this gas, that will not be the pressure of the oxygen. We have the volume of the oxygen, we have the temperature of the oxygen, but we have the pressure of a mixture of oxygen and water vapor. And if we're going to want to calculate the moles of oxygen in this container, we need to know the pressure of just the oxygen. We need to know its partial pressure. So we've got to learn how to get the partial pressure of oxygen in a container that looks like this. So in this particular container, I'll call this a udiometer, we have two gases. We have oxygen and water vapor. So if the pressure in the udiometer is calculated, the partial pressure of the water vapor would have to be subtracted away from the pressure of the oxygen, or actually from the total pressure, in order to get the partial pressure of the oxygen. So the partial pressure of the water vapor, which we're going to have to subtract, which is called water's equilibrium vapor pressure from an earlier chapter, or for short, we just call it water vapor pressure, depends only on the temperature, and we can look it up. So we're going to wind up looking up what the water vapor pressure is at whatever temperature our thermometer tells us. So if we can measure the pressure in the udiometer, and we'll talk about how to do that, then we're going to calculate the pressure of the oxygen by just subtracting the pressure of the water vapor from the pressure that's actually in the udiometer. And we'll look at two examples. These are two udiometers that have gases trapped by water, so they're collected by water displacement. And in the first one, uh, the levels are the same. In the second one, the levels aren't. So let's say we're collecting oxygen gas, and atmospheric pressure on this particular day in the lab is 765 millimeters of mercury. In the first udiometer, what's important to recognize is the water levels are the same on the inside and outside. What that means, a same, doesn't matter what the liquid is, if the levels are the same, that means the pressure in the udiometer is exactly equal to the pressure outside the udiometer. Here's the difference though. What's in the udiometer? It's oxygen plus water vapor. So therefore, the pressure of oxygen plus the pressure of water vapor is gonna equal the pressure outside. And if we want to calculate just the pressure of the oxygen gas, we're going to have to subtract the pressure of the water vapor from both sides of the equation. That's how we'll essentially do it. Now, where does that water vapor pressure come from? Well, it comes from knowing what the temperature of the water is. If we put a thermometer into the water and the water temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, we'll have a chart in our lab room 
and it tells what the water vapor pressure is at every different temperature you'd ever want to know. And if we just look up under 25 degrees Celsius, it says the water vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius is 24 millimeters of mercury. So in this equation at the bottom now, we don't know the pressure of oxygen, but we know the pressure of the water vapor is 24 millimeters of mercury, and we know the outside pressure is 765. So therefore, the pressure of oxygen plus 24 has to equal 765. We're just going to subtract the 24 millimeters from the 765, and that's going to tell us what the pressure of oxygen is in the first eudiometer. That comes out 741 millimeters of mercury. Let's go to the second one, because the second one is traditionally what happens when you collect a gas by water displacement. Usually we're not lucky enough that a chemical reaction produces just the right amount of gas to make the level of water inside the eudiometer the same as the outside. So you'll quite often have a situation where the level of water in the eudiometer is a little bit higher than it is on the outside. Let's talk about how we handle that. So what does it mean about the pressure inside of eudiometer number two if the levels are not the same? Well, because the water is higher in the eudiometer, that means in this case, the oxygen molecules are not pushing down as hard as the atmosphere. The atmosphere has a higher pressure. In other words, the oxygen has a lower pressure. So because the water level is higher inside the eudiometer, that means the pressure inside the eudiometer is less than the pressure outside. How much less is it? it's less by the difference that's measured. And in this picture, it's 27 millimeters less. So the pressure inside the eudiometer would equal the atmospheric pressure minus the difference in levels, okay? Now, the difference in levels are 27 millimeters of water. Atmospheric pressure is 765 millimeters of mercury. We're not gonna be able to subtract millimeters of water from millimeters of mercury. So we're gonna have to convert the 27 millimeters of water into what it would be if this container had mercury in it instead of water, okay? Now, the pressure inside the eudiometer, because we're collecting it actually by water displacement, is gonna be the pressure of the oxygen plus the pressure of the water vapor, and that will therefore equal the atmospheric pressure minus the difference in levels, which we're gonna to have to calculate what that would be in the units of millimeters of mercury, so let's do that. The difference in levels was 27 millimeters of water, and the equality statement between the two is inversely related to their densities, because mercury's density is 13.6 grams per milliliter, and water's density is 1.00 grams per milliliter. If we invert those, that means in terms of heights of columns, one millimeter of the more dense mercury will equal 13.6 millimeters of column height for the less dense water. So I can say 13.6 millimeters of water is equivalent to one millimeter of mercury, and I can convert the millimeters of water into what they would be if they were mercury. So in our equation at the bottom, the difference in levels would now be 2.0 millimeters of mercury. The atmospheric pressure is 765 millimeters of mercury, and the water vapor pressure is 24 millimeters of mercury. So we know every number in this calculation except for the partial pressure of oxygen. So to calculate that, we're gonna go 765 millimeters of mercury minus 2.0 millimeters of mercury and then minus the 24 millimeters of mercury. And we're gonna get the partial pressure of the water of the oxygen gas in this eudiometer to equal 739 millimeters of mercury. So we've done a lot of things here. Let's maybe recap it once and just sort of simplify this a little bit for you. So I've got a couple of pictures of, a UD, of eudiometers where gases are collected by mercury displacement on the left, and a couple of eudiometers where gases are collected by displacement of water on the right. I'm going to use AP to stand for atmospheric pressure, whatever that happens to be. That'll just be my abbreviation. And I'll use WVP to stand for water vapor pressure. So whatever that happens to be, we'll use that as its uh, symbol. So for each of these different eudiometers, let's see if we can determine what the pressure of the gas would be. Let's start with the one on the very left. That'll be eudiometer number one. The levels of mercury are the same on the inside and outside. If you're collecting a gas by mercury displacement and the levels are the same, the pressure of your gas just equals whatever the atmospheric pressure is. We're done with number one. In eudiometer number two, the levels are not the same. The level of mercury inside the eudiometer is higher than in the open beaker.
that means the gas's pressure is less than atmospheric pressure. And because my H in the picture is measured in millimeters of mercury, because we're collecting it by mercury displacement, I can directly subtract the atmospheric pressure in millimeters of mercury and H in millimeters of mercury. And so the pressure of the collected gas is just going to equal atmospheric pressure minus H. To the uh, other side, eudiometer number three, we have a gas collected by water displacement. The level of water is the same on the inside and outside. That means the pressure in the eudiometer has to exactly equal atmospheric pressure. But when you collect a gas by water displacement, there'll be some water vapor in there. So although the pressure in the eudiometer equals atmospheric pressure, the pressure of the gas we're trying to collect will be the atmospheric pressure minus any partial pressure due to the water vapor. So the pressure of our gas will be atmospheric pressure minus whatever WVP is. And quite often when you calculate the pressure of a gas, after you've subtracted its water vapor pressure, they call that the pressure of dry gas. So people know that the water vapor pressure has already been accounted for and subtracted. The final situation is what we'll see in our next experiment on the gas laws. We have a gas collected by water displacement and the levels are different. So the pressure inside this eudiometer has to be less than the atmospheric pressure because the level of water is higher in the eudiometer. So the pressure of the gas is going to be atmospheric pressure minus the difference in levels. And how do we get that into millimeters of mercury? We take the H millimeters of water and we divide it by 13.6. So if we subtract from the atmospheric pressure H divided by 13.6, that will be the pressure in the eudiometer. And then because some of that pressure in the eudiometer is due to water vapor, we will also have to subtract out the water vapor pressure. So the generic way to calculate the pressure of a gas trapped by water displacement, where the levels are not the same, is atmospheric pressure minus H divided by 13.6, and then minus the water vapor pressure. Let's do one example where we actually do a stoichiometric calculation from a gas collected in lab. Let's say a sample of zinc metal is reacted with hydrochloric acid and 44.2 milliliters of hydrogen gas are collected by water displacement. Some data about the experiment. Water temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. The water level is 54 millimeters higher inside the eudiometer. Barometric pressure is 752 millimeters of mercury. And water vapor pressure at 22 degrees Celsius is 20 millimeters of mercury. If we draw a picture of uh, what they're describing here, you can imagine a eudiometer inverted into a beaker of water and the level of water inside the eudiometer is 54 millimeters higher than the outside. We're gonna use this picture to calculate the pressure of the hydrogen gas inside that eudiometer because they've already told us the volume of hydrogen gas and we already know its temperature because we'll assume its temperature is the same as water's. So we'll use that picture to calculate what the pressure will be. What are we gonna do? We're gonna to try to calculate the mass of zinc that was in the original sample. So the one major calculation from our picture is to figure out what the pressure of the hydrogen gas is. The difference in levels are 54 millimeters of water. We have to convert that into millimeters of mercury. So I'm gonna use my conversion factor, 13.6 millimeters of water equals one millimeter of mercury. And that means that if mercury was in the container instead of water, the difference in levels would be 3.97 millimeters. So therefore, the pressure in the eudiometer is atmospheric pressure 752 minus 3.97. And then because there's going to be some water vapor in the eudiometer, we also have to subtract the water vapor pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury. So our pressure of dry hydrogen gas will be 752 millimeters of mercury minus 3.97 millimeters of mercury, minus 20 with a decimal point millimeters of mercury. That comes out 728 millimeters of mercury. If we're gonna be using the ideal gas law equation, I'm gonna to wanna to have that in atmospheres. So let me just do one more conversion here, converting the pressure from millimeters of mercury into atmospheres by using the equality statement, one atmosphere equals 760.0 millimeters of mercury. And so the pressure of the dry hydrogen gas is 0.957, guard digit nine, atmospheres. Now to do the stoichiometric calculation, we need the balanced equation. So this is the reaction of zinc with hydrochloric acid. This is a replacement reaction. Zinc's an active enough metal to replace hydrogen out of acids. It'll remove the hydrogen, bond with the chloride to form zinc chloride, 
And as the zinc atoms turn into zinc ions to bond with the chloride, it causes the hydrogen ions to turn into hydrogen atoms and you get hydrogen gas, which is diatomic. Balanced equation, we would need a two in front of the HCl. Now let's write down what's given and what we're trying to figure out. We've collected 44.2 milliliters of hydrogen gas and we're trying to solve for the mass of zinc. So the important ratio in this problem is that one to one mole ratio between the zinc and the hydrogen. First step is to always convert the given information into moles. So if we wanna convert the 44.2 milliliters of hydrogen gas into moles, this is a gas volume conversion. It's done with PV equals NRT. So we're gonna take our pressure of the dry hydrogen gas, which is 0.9579 atmospheres, multiplied by its volume converted to liters, 0 0.0442 liters, divided by the universal gas constant R, and divided by the temperature converted to Kelvin, which would be 295 with a guard digit 0.2 Kelvin. So this allows us to calculate the number of moles, the quantity of hydrogen gas trapped in the udiometer in this experiment. Atmospheres cancel out, liters cancel out, Kelvin cancel out, the moles in the denominator under a fraction bar flip to the top, and so therefore this udiometer contained this microscopically small number of moles of hydrogen gas, 0 0.001748 moles of hydrogen. So in a stoichiometric calculation, that's step number one, convert the given information into moles. Why do we do that? So now we can convert this into moles of any other reactant or product we want, and we want to calculate the number of moles of zinc, and the ratio is one to one. So I'm going to take my moles of hydrogen, multiply it by the one to one mole ratio, and I now have calculated how many moles of zinc must be in that contain uh, must have been reacted originally. If I want to know the mass of zinc that was reacted, I multiply by zinc's molar mass, arrange it so the moles cancel out, and that means that if you're going to collect 44.2 milliliters of hydrogen gas under these particular experimental conditions, then the original sample must have contained 0.114 grams of zinc.